Amen. So I guess if we're going to have a, a series on the miracles of Jesus, we should probably start with the first one. So we'll start with the first miracle of Jesus tonight, the water into wine, and we'll look, go through um, that story and see what we can learn from that. There's a lot um, to say about this miracle. It was the first miracle um, that Jesus did. It's documented in John chapter 2, and it's used uh, in a lot of you know, strange ways. Today I want to show you um, some, we're going to take a logical step through the Bible this evening and see what we can learn um, from this miracle. And we're also going to look at, you know, um, there's some points here on why we need to have a King James Bible as well. Um, so I'll show you that as well. But let's just go ahead and get right into it this evening and look at um, John chapter 2 and verse number 1. So first of all, there's a wedding and Jesus' mother is at this wedding. So I'm going to point out the things that we need to kind of know um, going into this. So it was the third day, the Bible says, there was a marriage in Canaan of Ga Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. So um, two things could have happened here. Either they ran out of wine or they didn't have wine in the first place. Um, I think it's probably more likely, um, as we'll see in uh, further verses, that they ran out. Um, we'll show you that. I'll show you that. Um, I'm speaking plural tonight. I don't know. We. There's nobody standing next to me. I will show you that um, this evening. Um, but I think that they probably ran out of wine here. So how could they run out of wine at the wedding? So first of all, turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. They ran out of wine here, and Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine. Look at Proverbs 21 and verse number 17. Keep your place in Proverbs. We're going to be going back and forth to Proverbs throughout um, the entire sermon. But we're going to pick up some clues. You have to read the Bible in context if you really want to understand what's happening and kind of, you know, dispel a lot of these stupid things that people say about the Bible. You just kind of have to read the whole Bible in context. What's actually happening in the story? Where are they? Who's there? You know, the who, what, when kind of thing, right? Um, so first of all, there's a clue here. Look at Proverbs 21 and verse number 17. The Bible says, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. So the Bible here says that, you know, somebody that loves wine and oil, you know, will not be rich. So first of all, you know, this is kind of giving us an idea that, you know, wine is expensive. Wine is something that is, you know, it's kind of a luxury. Um, the Bible says, you know, I mean, the same could be true today. Somebody that goes out, I don't care how much money you make, if you go out to a fancy restaurant and eat for every single meal, you're going to be broke. You know, if you just go out and you just eat at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, you know, twice a day, every single day of the week, you are going to be poor. That's the, the bottom line right there. Marriages, in general, are expensive. I mean, I've heard of marriages costing, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, maybe, you know, even more, depending on how crazy you want to get. So look, wine is a luxury. Wine is something that was expensive. So they ran out. It wasn't something that they just had an infinite amount of. Okay, look at John chapter 2 and verse number 4. The Bible says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I done? What am I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. Jesus' ministry has not started until this point. Okay, this is kind of the kickoff um, in this event right here. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So first of all, that's another clue right here in verse number six. First of all, you have these, these big water pots of stones. This is what Jesus actually turns into wine. But this is something that is used for the purifying of the Jews. This is what the Jews use. And a firkin, you know, if you look it up, look, there's several gallons of water in one of these things. You know, they're saying maybe it's 20 gallons a piece, 15 gallons a piece. Even if it's 10 gallons a piece in one of these vessels, these are big vessels of water. Okay, this is used for the Jews, you know, religious washings. All the washings that you see in the Old Testament, that's what this, these water pots are used for. So, I mean, we have a, a religious, you know, we have a religious group here, is what we see. Okay, and so we see these water pots, and, you know, for the ritual washing, we have a, a wedding of religious Jews, is what's happening here. Okay, look at verse 7. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. 
Then they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, he didn't know where it came from. That's what whence means. But the servants that drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which, was, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. And then verse 11 ends the story saying, This is the beginning of miracles. Did Jesus in Cana of Galilee? and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Go back to verse 10, and I just want to repeat verse 10 here, because we're going to talk about verse 10 in some detail this evening. It says, when the men have well drunk. It did not say, you know, when everyone was drunk. Okay? We'll get, we'll get to the definition of the word drunk, and we'll have a little English lesson um, here in a few minutes. But first of all, Jesus takes these huge water pots and turns them into wine. So first thing we need to know is, what is wine? What is wine in the Bible? That's the question. Did Jesus make alcohol? That is the question. Wine in the Bible. Turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Let's just do a quick Bible study on wine in the Bible. The Bible uses all kinds of different um, words um, to talk about alcoholic drinks. And Isaiah chapter 5, and verse number 11, we're not going to go to every single one of these verses, but I want to just show you a few so we can, um, you know, at least demonstrate the point that I need to make here. Look at Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 11. The Bible says this, the Bible says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink. You'll see that, those two words used a lot in the Bible, warning against drinking alcoholic beverages. It says, Woe unto them that they may follow strong drink and continue until night till wine inflame them. So we see there that, you know, wine, wine and strong drink, you know, those two things can be the same. Look at Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 11. Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 11. Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 11, the Bible says, so we see, I want to show you that wine is placed in the category many times of strong drink, but the Bible also differentiates certain kinds of wine. Look at Hosea 4.11. The Bible says, Hordom and wine and new wine take away the heart. So now we see a difference between new wine. We see a more specific you know, type of wine, if you will. Go back to Proverbs. You have your finger in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 23. And just keep a place in Proverbs, right in Proverbs 23 for the rest of the sermon. We're going to be going back to that again and again. Proverbs 23, look at verse number 31. What is wine? That is the question. What is wine? Look at what Proverbs 23 and verse number 31 says, the Bible reads in Proverbs 23, 31, look not, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Verse 32, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. So here the Bible is saying, look not upon the wine when it is in a certain condition. The Bible is saying, when, it, when it's red, when it moves um, by itself, when it gives its color in the cup. So we see a difference, a reference to wine when it's in a certain state here. Turn to Numbers chapter 6. Turn to Numbers chapter 6. And then we're going to have to do a little science project and talk to you about how, you know, wine is actually made um, to have alcohol in it, you know, on purpose. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Talking about um, someone um, who's not to have, you know, strong drink here. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse number 3, the Bible says, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. So this is talking about the Nazarite vow. This is talking about how someone is, you know, the Nazarite, someone that took a Nazarite vow was not even supposed to get near anything, any kind of juice or anything that came from a grape. Just in case, you know, something, you know, it may, you know, why even go near it? Kind of like this morning, right? Kind of like this morning. You know, to not touch a woman is to stay away from fornication. So don't even, don't even, you know, if we're all on the edge of a cliff, 
Let's not be, you know, standing over the cliff with one leg taking a selfie, right? I mean, that's basically what the Bible is saying, and it's the same philosophy in Numbers chapter 6 with the Nazarite vow. So, we see that there's a differentiation made on different types of wine. Strong drink, red wine, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves by itself in the cup. So, first of all, how is wine made? Let's, talk, let's look at that. Now, I just, this is just a, a quote from like a, a website that shows how to make wine, right here, okay? This is how it's made. It says, first, this is how you know, wine is made and how it ends up being alcoholic. Okay? First, grapes are harvest, harvested from the vineyard, either by human hands or by a machine. The moment the grapes are picked determines the acidity. Now, I mean, this I've heard is pretty, this is really scientific. Some of these, you know, really fancy grapes, they have, they've hired people, they pay them tons of money to go out there and decide, like, the exact hour that the grapes are harvested. So that's what it's talking about here. The moment the grapes are picked determines the acidity, sweetness, and flavor of the wine. Once the grapes are harvested, they are taken to the winery and sorted into bunches with rotten or underripe grapes removed. So they take the bad grapes out and throw them away. Then the grapes are run through a destemmer, then crushed by a mechanical press, which increases the sanitation quality and longevity of the wine. They probably didn't have this, you know, in, in Jesus' day. This is a modern uh, website here. This is where the white wines and red wines differ. So now listen to this. For white wines, the grapes are quickly crushed and pressed in order to separate the juice from the skins, seeds, and solids. This prevents any unwanted color or tannins from leaching into the wine. Grapes for red wines, however, are left in contact with their skins in order to acquire more flavor, color, and additional tannins, which help make the wine dry and bitter. Stingeth like an adder? Sound about right? Next, next, still from the website, is the fermentation process. Fermentation is when the sugars in the grape juice are converted into alcohol. The juice can begin fermenting naturally within 6 to 12 hours when wild yeasts are in the air or on the skin of the grape. So have you ever seen a red grape that has all this white stuff around the end? That is the yeast on the outside that has just come from the air. It's natural yeast, and when that is crushed with the juice, it begins the fermentation process like immediately, as soon as it gets in there. And the fermentation is basically biological breakdown of the wine. It's basically, you know, rotting, if you want to think of it that way. That's what fermentation is. So it begins fermentation naturally within 6 to 12 hours. Of course, they can add sugar. Like with white wines, they would add sugar and yeast, or they would add yeast, I'm sorry, from the outside to get it to ferment, to make that white wine alcoholic. But otherwise, white wines would not become alcoholic on their own unless some yeast from somewhere was put in there. Okay? By the way, leaven is yeast. Just for future reference, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So fermentation continues until all the sugar is converted into alcohol. For sweeter wines, winemakers will stop the process before all the sugar converts. Depending on the wine, the fermentation process can last anywhere from 10 days to a month or more. So a couple of things to note. There's a time element in the natural process here. So the longer this goes on, the more alcoholic the, you know, the more fermentation that happens and the more alcoholic it begins. Natural sugars begin fermenting right away as long as there's yeast present. Within hours you have alcohol forming. So especially if the skins were left in the mix, which is happening with what? What color wine? With red wine. Which is why the Bible says it warns against the wine when it's red, when it moveth itself in the cup. That's that chemical process of fermentation actually happening. And you can see it happening. There's solids in there. It's helping break down. You can see it actually happening. So it seems that the Bible warns about this. It seems that the Bible warns about this actual process that I'm reading you. Now, remember, there's no refrigerators in Jesus' time. So how would they, you know, stop fermentation from happening? First of all, they could just not allow it to happen in the first place and seal things and seal things from the outside world. That would be one way. Or, you know, a common way that is just common throughout history is, you know, they didn't have, um, you know, they didn't have big 
distilleries where they could distill out alcohol and things like that. But what they could do is just simply boil the alcohol off. I remember my mother doing that. If she was ever using wine to cook with something, she would simply boil it for a few minutes to get all the alcohol out of the wine and then she would use it as a cooking ingredient. So, I mean, it's a common thing um, that removes alcohol. So, back to the point of the sermon. Did Jesus make alcoholic wine? The, the Bible warns against, number one, wine when it is red, which implies that there is wine that is not red. So you have to remember that there's always another, if the Bible is warning about wine that is red, that means that there is wine that is not red. Otherwise it would just say, don't ever drink wine. Just don't have wine. It says, wine, when it moveth in the cup, meaning it's fermented, there's skins in there, there's yeast involved, means that there is wine that is not fermented. That's the second thing. And the third thing is the vinegar of wine, the, the wine that is already fermented, means that there is such a thing as pure wine, wine that has not been fermented, wine that is not rotten, so to speak. Now, first of all, yeast in the Bible is the same thing as leaven. And the Bible uses, we're not going to do a Bible study on this, but the Bible uses leaven as an analogy for sin. A little leaven in the church will leaven the whole lump. You can't just let sin come into the church and do nothing about it, or it will spread throughout the whole church. Amen. Amen. Yeast grows. It spreads. You can just keep making more and more yeast, and it just... A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. So basically yeast symbolizes sin, and yeast is what is used to make pure wine, alcoholic wine. Kind of fits. It kind of fits. So what did Jesus make is the question. What did Jesus make? So in order, because I have heard this miracle used for decades in my life to justify drinking alcohol. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. Are you better than Jesus? Have, I mean, I've heard that so many times. I'm embarrassed to tell you how many times I've heard that. Did Jesus make alcohol? In order to believe Jesus made alcohol, let's take a logical journey here. In order to believe Jesus made alcoholic wine, you have to believe a few things. I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm just going to tell you what you have to believe if you want to be logically consistent and believe Jesus made alcohol at that wedding. The first thing you have to believe is you have to believe that people at the wedding were drinking alcohol. You have to believe people at the wedding were drinking alcohol. Look, it clear, he clearly wasn't going to make strong drink or he wasn't going to make alcoholic beverages for a bunch of people that didn't drink. I mean, why would he do that? I mean, he clearly wasn't going to come to a bunch of religious Jews that were against drinking and against drinking alcohol and just make them a bunch of alcohol. That makes no sense. So we know that, right? So you have to believe, you have to believe that the people at the wedding were drinking alcohol. That's the first thing you have to believe. Okay? And look, the Bible doesn't say that. And what do we know about the Bible and just like connecting dots ourselves with the Bible? It's going to lead you to trouble every single time. Now look, here's why people have a problem with this. Here's why people have a problem with this. Because this is, because you're sitting here and you're thinking in your head, and I know some of you are thinking this right now, because your culture is messing with you. Right. Your culture is wrecking how you think. Your culture is ruining how you read the Bible. Because you're like, well, they're at a wedding. Of course they're getting drunk. Because that's what people do at weddings in our culture. That's what people do in American culture at weddings, is they get drunk. That's what Catholics do at weddings in American culture, is everybody gets drunk, including the priest. Why not? But that is your culture messing with you. When you read this and you say, oh, the people are well drunk. You're like, oh yeah, you know, everybody's drunk at this wedding, because that's what people do. No, your culture is what's getting you here. Okay, just because you grew up where a wedding equals everybody getting drunk doesn't mean that it is like that for everyone at any given time throughout history. That's ridiculous to think that. I mean, that's a, that's a bold belief. That's a leap. And that's your culture messing with you. I remember when we moved, I grew up Lutheran. This was the culture 
in Lutheran culture is at weddings, there's a huge party afterwards. That's the culture that I grew up in. Now, we moved to Texas. We moved to Texas, and I went to my first Texas wedding after we were in Texas for a year or two. One of my wife's friends or coworkers um, got married, and we went to this wedding, and it was a, it was a Baptist wedding, because everyone in Texas is a Baptist. You know, or a lot of people in Texas are Baptists. It's the Bible Belt. And we went to this Texas wedding, and we went to the wedding in a church, and we went to the reception, and there was no alcohol there. There was no d big dance. There was no alcohol. There was just good food and people walking around talking. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I told my wife, I was like, this is really strange. It's like, and you know what? I was happy about it. I was just like, wow. It's not like how I grew up everywhere. And we went to this Baptist wedding. So look, your culture can mess with you when you read the Bible. Don't let it do that. You got to cancel. I hate to say this. You got to cancel your culture. All right. <laughs> Did I actually say that just now? You got to cancel your worldly culture and pick up this culture right here. That's what you got to do. That's the cancel culture that should happen. Cancel whatever the world has taught you and just whatever you read in the Bible, that's what you adopt. There you go. But here's the thing. People read the Bible and they're like, you know, these people are drunks just like me. No, they're not. Let me read you the NIV. Pull out your NIV right now. Modern Bible versions. And look, this is wicked. I'm going to show you how subtle this is in the Bible. Look at verse number 10. This is why you have to have a King James Bible. These, these new Bible versions, like it is, it is brilliant. I mean, it is brilliant how subtle it is on just attacking the Word of God. Because look, it is turning Jesus into a sinner is what it's doing. That's exactly what it is doing here. But it's so subtle. It's so subtle. I'm going to read for you the NIV. You look at verse number 9. The NIV says this, And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guest had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. So look, the, the, the NIV basically said, when everyone's drunk. That's what the NIV implied it meant. The King James says, when everyone is well drunk. Look, drunk has three meanings, if you look it up in the dictionary. Drunk means, first of all, it's a verb. Drunk meaning past participle, if you remember what a participle is, past tense, basically, of the word drink. Right. It's a verb. So I had, I had drunk too much coffee. So I couldn't, we stayed, we stayed at church until 11 o'clock on Sunday night. I had drunk way too much coffee and I stared at the ceiling at my house until two in the morning. That's how you use drunk in the terms of the King James Bible in verse number 10. Okay. Or, or it could be a noun like that guy, that guy's a drunk. He's a drunk. Somebody who drinks alcohol constantly. He's just a drunk. Or somebody who is, it could be an adjective describing that person. That guy, that guy, he's drunk, meaning he's had too much alcohol. Well, there's three meanings. Which meaning is used in verse number 10? It is the past tense of the word drink. That's what it is. Meaning they had had enough. They were full. You go and have a big steak and you're full. You don't want another steak. And that's when you bring out the, the inexpensive you know, food and drink and all those things. But this guy's like, he bought out, brought out the best stuff when everybody had already been well drunk. They already had enough to drink. Okay? So first of all, you have to believe, number one, you have to believe that everybody was drinking alcohol at the wedding. Okay? The Bible does not say that. Okay? And then, then it gets even better. So Jesus made alcohol. That's what we're trying to prove here, okay? We're trying to prove that Jesus made alcohol so we can all go out and be a bunch of drunks. All right? That's what we're going to do. We're going to follow that path. So everybody had to be um, drinking alcohol at the wedding. Well, we've already got a problem there. The Bible doesn't say that. Here's the second thing. You have to believe that Jesus gave alcohol to already drunk people. I mean, what in the world? I mean, here's a bunch of people. They're already, they've had too much to drink, the NIV tells me. These people are all drunk. And Jesus is like, here's some more booze! Woo! 
I mean, what in the world? Jesus turned, uh, you know, water into wine, man. <laughs> Turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. You have to believe that Jesus gave alcohol to people that were already drunk. He's not going to give alcohol to people that don't drink. They're going to be like, this wine is red. It moves in the cup. Get it away from us. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 1. Let's just be logical. That's all I'm asking you this evening. Let's just think this through. Proverbs chapter 20. The whole Bible has to make sense, right? The Bible can't contradict itself. If we find something, we're like, Jesus made alcoholic wine. Then we have to be able to fit that into the Bible. That can't, like, we can't have problems with the Bible. The Bible can't all of a sudden contradict itself because of what I believe. Or I believe the wrong thing. This is a perfect book, folks. If you find a problem with it, the problem's you. Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived by, thereby is not wise. Let me read for you Isaiah 28. So I guess Jesus was not wise by giving alcohol to these people. Isaiah 28 verse 7. But they have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. You think Jesus gave people a bunch of things so they could stumble in judgment? Look, alcohol will cause anyone that, to, that drinks it to err. Amen. That's what the Bible is saying here. The priests here. The priests erred. The, the priests were getting drunk. The priests were getting drunk. Adjective. The priests were drunks. Noun. The priests, the priests weren't well drunk. They were drunks in Isaiah chapter 28. Look, go back to Proverbs 23. Are you there? That's, Proverbs 23 is probably the best set of just overall verses in the Bible on why you should never touch alcohol. Proverbs 23. Anyone that, you, look, you will say things, you will say perverse things if you are you know, if you drink alcohol, you will be swearing, you will be doing things that you would never do right. when you drink alcohol, if you would drink alcohol. Maybe that's what Jesus wanted. Maybe he wanted these people to swear and be perverse. He gave them a bunch of alcohol. Look at Proverbs 23 and verse 29. Look, here's why, look, just highlight this in your Bible. If you're like, man, I, I just, I, I struggle with drinking. Here, here, this is all you need right here. Proverbs 23, verse, or 20, I'm sorry, 29. I've led you astray. Let me check here. It's 23. Proverbs 23. I'm going to check real quick. Proverbs 23, and look at verse 29. Proverbs 23, and verse 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Look, the Bible says here that you're going to have trouble. You're gonna you're gonna be sad, you know. You're gonna you're, you're gonna have like contentions with people around you. Meaning, meaning you're gonna get in fights all the time. Who has babbling? You're gonna say stupid things. You're not even gonna make sense in what you're saying. Who has wounds without a cause? You're gonna get hurt, and you're not even gonna know how you got hurt. Your eyes are gonna be all red. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. There we see again a different type of wine. Look not. Upon the wine when it is red. We've already read that. Look at verse 33. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Things that you wouldn't even think about doing, you will do if you drink alcohol. Your heart will be, your heart, it says your heart will utter perverse things. Meaning, you, you know, I have a heart towards the Lord. We talked about that this morning. You know, you're looking for somebody, young people, you are looking for somebody who's not just going through the motions in this life. You're looking for somebody who has the heart to serve the Lord with their life. That's what you're looking for. But alcohol will change your heart. Alcohol will, will turn your heart to perverse things, to do things that you would never want to do, you know, if, if you didn't drink alcohol. And then you, you'll, you'll end up in fornication, it says here. I mean, think of all the stories in the Bible about people drinking alcohol. I mean, what? Yeah. I mean, talk about perverse. I mean, nothing good ever happened to anybody in the Bible 
that drank alcohol. And I'm telling you this right now, nothing good will ever come of in your life from drinking alcohol. Yeah. Only bad. Right. Only bad. Why would you want to do it? Oh, because it makes me happy. No, it'll bring you sorrow. It'll bring you sorrow. Verse 34, Yea, thou shalt be as that he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or he that lieth upon the top of a mast. It's like you'll just end up in strange places. You won't even know where you are. Verse 35, They have stricken me, thou shalt say. I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. Then I, I shall awake, and I will seek it again. Boy, have you ever met anybody like this? It's like, you know, you're just like, what are you doing to your life? What are you doing to your life? And then you just keep doing it again and again and again. They lose their job. They just keep going and going and going. Look, you have to think, you have to think that Jesus gave people woe to think that he created alcohol at the wedding. You have to think that Jesus gave people sorrow and caused contentions amongst them. I mean, that's what you have to believe. And fights. He's like, you know what? I'm going to give some of these people, I'm going to make them fight amongst each other. I'm going to give these people wounds without cause. You know, look, nothing positive will ever come from it. Why would Jesus give it to anyone? It makes no sense at all. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It'll, look, it'll destroy you. It'll destroy you. It'll destroy your body. Look, fornicate. it'll lead you to fornication, which will give you the three Ds. Disease, divorce, and despair. I mean, it's, it's horrible. It'll ruin you. It will actually ruin your health, ruin your body. So maybe Jesus wanted to ruin these people's bodies. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? So, your body isn't even yours, the Bible says. If you're saved, the Bible says, for you're bought with a price. So, Christ purchased you. Therefore, I glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Christ purchased you with his own blood. And he's going he's gonna to want you to drink alcohol. He's going to make alcohol. Look, it doesn't make any sense. You can't make sense out of it in the Bible. He's just going to help them destroy their bodies. Like if he gave them alcohol, he made them drunk. And here's another one I've heard. Go to Proverbs 31, verse 6. This will be a quick one. Proverbs 31 and verse number 6. Because the Bible does say something about a certain group of people where it's just like, ah, just let them drink. <laughs> you know, go to Proverbs 31 and verse number 6. Proverbs 31 and look at verse, let's start at, at verse 3. The Bible says, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. So look, this is, this, is, uh, this, is, this is Solomon's mother teaching him. She's teaching him advice on how to choose a wife. This is, of course, the chapter on the virtuous woman. But before, she gives him a little bit of advice on alcohol. She says, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. She's like, it's not for you. She's like, alcohol is not for you. And then she says this. She says, lest they drink and forget the law. Because like, look, you drink, you're going to forget the Bible. You will forget what the Bible says. You will forget everything. And you will just do the perverse things that the Bible says that you will do. And then she says this. She says in verse 6, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. She says, you know, and, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. She's like, look, all these unsaved people, all these wicked people, just, just let them drink. It's not for you. It's like, for the saved people, it's not for you. Look, you're kings and priests. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. We're kings and priests. You have a priesthood. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's not for you. But all, you know, all the reprobates and wicked people out there, let them drink. That's what she's saying here. So maybe Mary, Jesus' mother, was hanging out with a bunch of reprobates. No. No. And maybe Jesus is just like giving wine to a bunch of reprobates. It, that, it, it, you know, that's dumb. Look, Jesus did not <coughs> make alcohol at this wedding. Recap, you have to believe that people were drinking alcohol and you have to believe that Jesus made them drunker. That's what you have to believe. And look, here's another thing. And if you have a bunch of people, here, here's why they weren't drinking alcohol at the wedding. 
Here's why they were religious Jews at a wedding and they weren't drinking alcohol in the first place. Because the governor in verse number 10, what did he say? He said, this is great. He said, this wine is great. What happens? What happens? I'll explain it. If you don't know what happens, God bless you. But what happens when you have a bunch of drunks sitting around drinking and you bring them a bunch of fruit punch? Are they going to be like, this is great? You know what drunks who are drunk want? They want more alcohol. That's what the Bible says in Proverbs. It says they wake up and they want it again. And they want it again. And they want more. And they want more. And they want more. You bring a bunch of non-alcoholic stuff to a bunch of drunks, they're not going to appreciate it. This governor was like, this is, this is the best. This is pure wine. This is pure wine. It, it, he's like, this is expensive stuff, is what he was saying. You have to believe that Jesus made them drunker, and you can't give fruit punch to a bunch of drunk people. It's not going to work. And basically, the biggest thing here is you have to believe that Jesus was a sinner. That, that's where it all comes down. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I mean, the NIV implies this. That's exactly what the NIV implies. The NIV is implying that these people, they had too much to drink. They were all drunk, the NIV says. And then Jesus gave them more wine. More wine from Jesus. Look, it's, it's not just a small thing. Like, the devil knows what he's doing when he's changing God's word. It's very pointed, very subtle attacks on the deity of Christ. Because look, if Jesus was a sinner, we're not going to heaven. That's how serious it is. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. The Bible says, well, look, look at verse 21. For even hereunto we are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Example. He was pretty good, but he sinned sometimes. That ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Look, he did no sin, he spoke no sin, he thought no sin, he had no sin. There was no sin in him. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. I'll read for you 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For he hath made himself sin for us, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Look, he became sin. He knew no sin. He became it. He didn't, look, he didn't, he didn't deserve it. He didn't have it. He became it for us, is what the Bible says. It's a, it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. If Jesus sinned, I'm not saved. That's how big of a deal it is. When some stupid idiot says that Jesus made a bunch of people drunk. Jesus made wine. You're a moron. You don't get saved. We're not saved if Jesus had one sin. I mean, it's an attack on the gospel, is what it is. These things are not small. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest. Jesus is the high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Look, Jesus was tempted just like you. Jesus had the flesh just like you, except he didn't sin. He didn't do it. He didn't fall for the temptation. But in all points, he was tempted as like we are, yet without sin. Jesus did not turn water into alcoholic wine. You say, no big deal. It's a big deal. It's an attack on the gospel itself. It is the biggest deal. And look, if Jesus turned water into alcohol, either Jesus is a sinner or drinking alcohol is not a sin. And we know both of those can't be true. Because of what? Because of the Bible, the Word of God. You know, the problem is, you know, the problem is it just, it's much simpler than this. It's just people don't have any problem turning Jesus into a sinner to justify sin in their life. That's really what's going on. I mean, I think I might even heard saved people say stupid things like this. You know, Jesus made wine. I mean, look, when you read the Bible, you have to take it for what it says. And for, you know, that's another thing. Remember what we said at the beginning. You've got to forget the corrupt culture that you came from. You know, it's a hard thing. If you can't get that culture out of yourself when you read the Bible, when you listen to preaching, and, you know, you, 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 it's going to stunt your growth in your Christian life. The quicker you can recognize the effects of your culture and recognize, oh, that, that's how I grew up. 
oh, that's how I was taught how to do things. That was wrong. The Bible says this. The quicker you can do that, the faster you're going to grow in this Christian life. It's the people that can't get that culture out and can't, can't admit that, that bad culture in their life. Those are the people that are they're just stunted. They're stunted in their Christian life for years and years and years. And we don't have that much time here. You've got to make logical connections when you read the Bible. And here's another thing. You can't fill in blanks. You can't fill in blanks. Don't make the Bible say what it doesn't say. You know, it's a wedding. They must all be drunk. No, you said that, not the Bible. No, 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 no. You just said something where your corrupt culture came in and changed the Word of God. You know, red flag. You've got to catch that stuff. The more you're able to catch those things, the more you're able to just really completely look at your life, look, I'm right there with you. The more you can completely look at your life and just say, you know what, everything I was ever taught is pretty much wrong. And just, just, just go completely with what the Bible says, the faster you are going to grow. Just take the Bible by itself, leave your culture behind. This is Jesus' first miracle. He didn't get a bunch of people drunk. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.